Good, so welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is the 7th of March, not February. Anyway, February went fast there. Um, <laughs> 7th of March, 2012, and we have an interesting cast of characters tonight. A lot of us are new to um, Teachers Teaching Teachers. Welcome, everybody. We'll introduce people as we go kind of thing. Um, Steve Harkinon is with us, and um, Monica and Steve were um, in the hallway at uh, the Digital Media Learning Conference in San Francisco, and they were having a fascinating conversation. And I'd like you guys to kind of kick this off tonight, set the tone by saying what you were talking about there. Does that sound like a fair assignment. And then we'll get around to introducing the wonderful people here from uh, Mary Beth from the Bronx, Mary Beth from Philadelphia. Um, a couple of people, a mother and a daughter, Annie and Julia, who have been at a rally in British Columbia uh, having a labor dispute up there. They're going to talk about uh, whether the government is respecting teachers. <laughs> um, and Bill O'Neill from New Jersey has joined us as well, and Chad Sansing is, and so that's that's the crew, and there may be others joining us. Um, Steve and Monica, is that a good enough? Can I throw it to two of you and talk about what a narrative is and what you guys were talking about there in the window? Monica, do you want to go ahead? How oh, shoot, I was going to jump in and be Steve. Um, is it, am I the only one that's hearing that back noise? No. No, there is some. I'm hearing it, yes. Yeah. I'm okay, though. It's not that big a deal. Okay. So, Steve. Yes. Tell us about um, your whole narrative idea, your, your idea to change the world through a narrative. <laughs> The Gandhi, well, so we, the Gandhi we, idea. The Gandhi idea. So we were at the digital media, uh, digital media and learning conference in San Francisco, and a few weeks back, I was at a conference at Stanford where they described the evolution of Finland's education system, and kind of intriguingly, if you kind of peel back the layers of that story, you get to the story of equity, this belief that. Uh, that it was really important to have every child have an equal chance for education. And I got to thinking about the cultural consensus they had around equity and the fact that we probably would have a very hard time in the United States telling that same story. That we tell a story of competing interests, uh, politically, economically, and um, uh, socially that, that um, that probably don't lend themselves to equity. So I thought I was thinking about narrative just in the sense of what would our narrative be? You know, if, is there a narrative that we could use to describe education that would uh, appeal to inherent values, Western values, but at the same time would showcase the problems of our existing education system? So when we were there at the Digital Media and Learning Conference, it felt like there were two kind of larger threads. One was a group of people who were very much interested in helping learners become self-learners and um, a very sort of horizontal model for schooling. And then there were the uh, tech vendors who were a very vertical model, um, and a lot of large companies and foundations kind of jumping on board the idea of ed tech as a disruptive force in education, but telling a story of, of uh, compliance still, but more skilled compliance. So we were just kind of playing with the idea that in a vertical environment, you don't really need a narrative that's completely game changing, but in a horizontal narrative, you need something that everybody could unite behind. And I don't know if it's realistic or how we feel about it, but you know there are, there are a couple that occurred to us, and I think this is what I was talking about. One was uh, an idea that no child should be told, no child or should be told or no parent should be told that their child is defective, right? That we have an inherent belief in the value of every individual. And especially as parents, we have an inherent belief, we have a belief in the inherent value of our own children. 
And the other would be kind of uh, a narrative of reclaiming dignity, dignity for everybody in the process, uh, the student, the teacher, uh, the parent, that, that in a lot of ways we've ceded that dignity to the system. So if you think of larger social change, then you probably need a narrative that, like the civil rights movement that you could really use to galvanize widespread social change, but knowing that it would be painful. Uh, if you think of uh, uh, just adding ed tech on top of the current uh, educational climate, you don't need that sweeping narrative. So our question was, well, what could that sweeping narrative be? You know, is there something that that um, that a large portion of people would get behind that would show the difference between kind of the current ways in which we treat teachers and students and what's uh, possible, better, desired in uh, the connected world? So, Monica, what did I leave out, and did I get anything wrong? I think you did good. Um, I would just add just another idea of it um, from. Meg Wheatley and Deb Fries's walk out, walk on, the whole idea of trans local and scaling across, you know, and, and again, to have that rhizomatic, non hierarchical means of is it a narrative that um, you can, you know, start anywhere and take everywhere? So, I, just what you said, just adding another little bit of a perspective. So anybody that wants to jump in, um, it's, a, it's an ongoing discussion, um, but one that we would love to see in action. And, and let me invite people who are new here, and let me go to Mary Beth Whitehouse, because Mary Beth, you and I were in conversation already about coming on to the show and do you want to say why what's your campaign introduce yourself <laughs> a little bit and 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 then i think we'll we'll link back to the big ideas because i think they're about dignity and respect um you know catherine shulton at the learning blog at the new york times sent me knew what we were talking about here tonight and sent me a um, MetLife survey of the American teachers, which just came out today. It said job satisfaction for teachers hits the lowest point. And they give lots of reasons, but it has to do with um, ha not having adequate um, professional development, um, having your job security not very secure. And lots of other re uh, reasons, but I think that's sort of the context that I would like to bring to bear into that narrative conversation about how we want to treat teachers and, and students. Anyway, Mary Beth, jump in. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm here, I guess, to talk about um, what's been happening in New York City around the release of teacher data. And if you're unfamiliar with what that is, you've probably read about it in your paper, but uh, much like Los Angeles, New York City kept uh, data on their students and then tried to use a very complicated algorithm to figure out the value add, how much value teachers added to their students. So basically what that involved is making a prediction about what a student at a certain level would do and then compare that to what in fact the student had done under your tutelage for that year. And that would then determine your value add. Now they tried to, in, according to the algorithm, take into account things like income levels, race, uh, borough, et cetera, uh, special education needs, things like that, and then uh, in an agreement with the UFT several years ago, they said they would let the teachers know their value add, but they would keep it secret for um, so that it would just be a personal discussion between you and the principal, and you could try and make sense of it or look at your personal weaknesses, et cetera, if you even found any personal weaknesses in that data. And instead, what they decided to do was to release the data. Now they didn't do this on their own because they couldn't. 
instead, and by the way, um, I attend lots of professional development, so I was privy to hearing this information from Juan Gonzalez, who's the Daily News reporter, and he told me that the Bloomberg administration went to the media outlets and told them that the data was available. And if they wanted it, they would have to file suit under the Freedom of Information Act. And mm -hmm. nobody bit. And then what happened is they went back to the media outlets and then told them that they told the Times that the news was going to file. And they told the news that the Times was going to file. And they told the Post that Newsday was going to file. And pretty soon there was a feeding frenzy and all the media outlets got together, save a few, and they filed jointly for the release of the information. And apparently, in once the court order came down, in record time, the DOE complied. And there's even a study on this by the Columbia School of Journalism as to like how quickly the DOE replied, because it is highly unusual for them to, even with a court order, to come up with the data in no time, and yet they did. Um, and so there's been a huge reaction to it in New York City reactions like personal reactions like I'm sharing with you now but for instance if you live locally then you could easily have picked up one of the rags with the headline and a picture New York City's worst teacher or the best teacher in New York City can you imagine that being you with your picture there on, on either case and then you've had media outlets for instance my phone began to ring the day the media was re the, where the data was released in a half hour I must have had 17 phone calls can you confirm? Would you uh, agree to an interview? Would you? And it, it, I'm not the only person for whom that has happened. And then parents were contacted. And how do you feel about having your student, your child in the class with the worst teacher? Or how do you feel about having the best teachers in New York City? Or are you surprised that six of the worst teachers are at your school? Um, and some parents had the reaction that the media was looking for and other parents have been rather savvy about the data and have in fact said, I, you know, what matters to me is that my child loves my, the teacher and vice versa, and I really feel like they know who they're, who they're dealing with. Then we have some outlets like the Times who agreed to print it, but they've been, I don't know, may up culping ever since. You know, they've been trying to provide a section for you to put your comments on as a teacher when Maybe. I went and I just wanted to add also they, they created a, a little widget which made it really easy to look up your school yes. <laughs> as well and That's compare true. the teachers in your school. So the New York That's Times true. didn't just publish it. They made, they made it easy to use as well. Right. Um, yeah. In fact, most of the outlets have done that, like uh, Wall Street Journal's done that, the Daily News has done that, et cetera. So what I did is I started to get emails from my friends and my family saying, Congratulations, you you know, you are, we always knew you were a great teacher. I am in an exclusive group known as the 99th percentilers, not to be confused with the Occupy Wall Street movement. And, um, and so I was so frustrated that I was pleased that my family and friends wanted to compliment me because teaching can be such, uh, you do so much work in isolation. But on the other hand, my friends and family also know how damn hard I work all the time and that I didn't feel this data was representative of anything of great significance, that, that in fact it's the 186 other days that I work my ass off that really matters, not that one day that my kids test. So I wrote an email to my friends and family, which basically summarized my feelings about it, then, then edited it a bit and attached it to my data on the New York Times page, and it caught some attention. And particularly because I'm in the, the high group, and I guess people don't expect you to reject the data when ostensibly you benefit from it. Um, and then I I got a lot of feedback, and I thought to myself, okay, let's do something with this. And I spoke to a New York Times reporter, and I have a, you know, a, I don't know if you can call it a petition, but a statement, and I've done a lot of, I don't know, it's all it's all right on the edge of crazy. Like, I got the spreadsheets from the, what did I get them from, New York One. So it's the raw data. And what I did is I culled it and found all the other 99th percentilers. And then I tracked down all their emails using the DOE website. 
And then I emailed each and every one of them and sent them the statement and asked them to sign it because I thought it would be really powerful if the people who on the surface appear to benefit from it would reject it. And so that's been getting a lot of attention and with some success, but not great success. So around 10% response rate is, is probably, a, you know, a, is probably a, if you're sending out mass mailings, you'd probably be happy to get that, but I'm not very pleased with a 10% return. So anyhow, I'm trying to figure out clever ways just shy of stalking that could get the other people to sign. Mary Beth, I want a lot of other people to jump in here and ask you questions, but could you say a little more about the accuracy of the judgment in your case? Uh, sure. Well, I, I'm a special education teacher, and um, so if you're not from New York City, what you may not know is that the only teachers listed are ELA and mathematics teachers, so there's no science teacher, there's no social studies, no gym, no language, et cetera. Um, and just fourth through eighth grade, right? Fourth through eighth grade, and also that I teach both ELA and mathematics. I was only listed as a math teacher, which is, in fact, why I'm like, you know, on the high end. And I wrote that to my friends and family saying, you know, if I were, if my data was listed as an ELA teacher, I would be lucky to be listed as average. And that I, what did they think? That I turned it on like during math, but I turned it off during ELA? It, that it's so the data is so capricious that it, it's it's really mind-boggling and the data is old and not all kids are listed under every teacher and one lady was out on maternity leave and yet she got credited with some scores and I mean they're, they're so faulty in so many a myriad of ways that it's I, I actually in my times thing I wrote that I thought it approached uh, libel to even publish it Wow I have to so say please jump in, folks. <laughs> Monica, that's, we didn't hear that. Say it again. Narrative. That's the narrative we need to change, right? <laughs> that's the narrative. That's the one. That's at least one of them. Yeah. Well, Mary Beth, in British Columbia, that's the what the teachers are currently heading towards. Our government is currently trying to pass a bill that will introduce a similar system of evaluation, remove all seniority in post and fill situations. Um, we, there will be no caps on the number of students allowed in the classroom, oh. no caps allowed in the number of students with identified behavioral or learning needs in the classroom. So we're talking there could be, well, there already is a class of 30 kids in a metalwork classroom, grade nine through 12, with six seriously identified and more unidentified in a classroom built for 24. Wow. So I was out protesting for the last three days in a big rally today to try to change that. Good for you. <laughs> 40,000 40, teachers in BC have been out for the last three days. Wow. Introduce yeah. yourself and maybe your daughter as well here. I'm Delia. I'm a teacher in the southern interior of British Columbia. And my daughter is Anne, and she's at uh, BCIT studying civil engineering. She's a vic she's a she's not a victim of the I, BC education system. Well, how, but, uh, I'll say, how I'll say it is is um can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um is uh I I'm not so much a victim. Um I always liked education. So for me, even though I wasn't always given the best opportunities with the increased budget cuts and everything, I still managed to do well in courses. However, it didn't mean that I didn't see the effects of increased um, number of students in classrooms. I myself was ejected from a chemistry 12 class because the existing one in our school already had 33 students. Um, and as such, I had to teach chemistry to myself for all of grade 12. And when you don't do well in, I, when I didn't do well in grade 11, if it weren't for the support of a very helpful teacher who went, used his own time to help me out, I probably wouldn't have ever succeeded in that class. So uh, although I'm not a teacher, it is uh, and extremely important to me because it's teachers that have helped me get to where I am in engineering now. So that's kind of why I'm interested in this. Um, our current, I'm sorry, my telephone is ringing. <laughs> my current uh, Minister of Education Do I get it? has. Re okay. No, it'll, it'll go. Um, okay. He's removed the cap on the number of 
uh, special needs or um, identified students because he feels it's discriminatory to set them apart from the from the average students in the classroom. So by eliminating the caps, then we're not discriminating against the identified students. So we're in a bit of, and I've been studying a lot about what's going on in New York and other parts of the US. Wisconsin was mentioned a number of times today in the rally because our government is really working hard at union busting at this point. And we had at least six other unions out protesting with us today. So. And there's talk of a complete general strike happening in BC before too long. So. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I'm actually a second generation union activist in my family, so. Mm -hmm. is, and this is tied to Occupy Wall Street? No, not at all, it, but um, it's just because our government, um, um, basically we've been in negotiations trying to get a new contract to in BC since September, and they basically are legislating us back. We've been on a situation where we're not doing any administrivia, we're simply teaching, um, and we're not doing attendance, well we're doing attendance, we're not doing report cards, um, parents can contact us, we will tell them how their students are doing. But basically, they're legislating us back to work tomorrow, or not tomorrow, but they're legislating us back to work, and they're legislating a mediator to come in and sell the contract, but the mediator is not allowed to talk about money. The mediator is the one that's been chosen not by the Labor Relations Board, but by the government. We're negotiating with the government. If they don't like what we're doing, they've changed the laws so that we can't do it anymore. Wow. Yeah. We're living under a dictatorship right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think a lot of it, um, from what you've uh, talked about, Mayor Beth, is um, you talk about this value add the government, uh, in, or whoever uh, is responsible for the money is about this value add. And the legislation in BC currently has this net zero mandate. And to me, they're both things, and net zero means that the government is not prepared to accept any increase in wages or you know, what goes in, what comes out. And to me, both this value add and this net zero both seem to be like um, education is to being treated more and more and more like a, a like a business. But like you said, there's no, you know, teachers are evaluated by what they, how the students improve. But how I look at it is education isn't just, isn't a business, it's an investment. You teach that kid how to do their alphabet in grade one, it might be, you know, 11, it's 11 years till they graduate, and even then it might be another six, eight years before they start returning your investment, when if they do post-secondary. So, and I think that's a big thing, is that at, by treating education like a business, they're basically also treating teachers like a given. You're being, hit like, it's, it's, oh yeah, I send my kid to this school, and these people teach, uh, teach them what they need to know and then they come home at the end of the day, but there's no real thought to how much work teachers need to be, uh, teachers need to put in each day. And it also isn't really, th there's, even though the family might not think of value add, it is kind of how teachers are more and more being looked at in this, how much can they give us aspect. Can I, can I actually jump in yeah. real quick? Welcome, this introduce is the, yourself, this is, Mary Beth. This is the other Mary Beth. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm in Philadelphia, and what's really interesting for me is hearing you guys talk is um, I was in the school district of Philadelphia, Union School District of Philadelphia, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of employees, or I should say teachers, um, for over five years. And now I'm at a small charter school with no union. So, you know, I hear you talk about contracts, I hear you talk about being on strike, I t hear you talk about, well, I don't know about strikes, but I guess, you know, those kind of situations. And it's been a really eye-opening experience for me to be, and you were talking about business and how schools are run by uh, kind of like a business, to be in a situation where you're an at-will employee, where at any point, you know, you could, they could say, well, bye-bye, you know, and you just really have no security at all. And so there's that fear where no one's going to ever say, I won't do report cards. No one's ever going to say, I won't do this, I won't do that, because at any minute you could have no job. So um, I'm probably the minority where I don't care. <laughs> 
where I just speak my mind and I just, you know, I cannot sit back and just not um, stick up for myself. But I know a lot of my colleagues would never put their themselves on the line like that. So I guess what um, what I'm thinking about is that narrative that you know Steve is talking about is that when we have people who are coming from all these different kinds of situations, how do we build that that narrative when people are scared to stick up for themselves, or when you know um, they're being treated like they're at will employees, or when teachers have to fight for what they think is right and then we've got you know people who are in charge have a whole other vision of how things should be so i guess to me it just kind of all just came together where i'm just kind of thinking about how do we come together to build that narrative when we have such a, a wide variety of experiences so uh, that's just what i'm thinking right now listening to everything can i jump in thanks Please, go ahead, Steve. <laughs> yeah, please do. <laughs> so I'm very intrigued, and, and you can help me figure this out. I'm not a teacher, so I'm looking at this from a little bit of a different perspective. But it feels to me like what's taking place in New York is very much parallel with sort of traditional measures of students. And that the, uh, the potential narrative there is that these measures are shallow and, and are not really helpful. And the kind of ranking system that students are used to is now happening in New York for teachers. And so my question to teachers, the, to you as a group would be, is it hard for teachers to see that? Because that would be the real narrative for me, which is both the student and the teacher aren't being treated with dignity. New York is raising it for the teachers, but do the teachers see the parallel with students? And I'm hearing withholding of report cards is a protest, but not because report cards are morally a bad way to measure students. Can you hear Great me? Great question. <laughs> yep, go ahead. It's, it's Mary Beth. So on my um, statement that I'm asking people to sign, Steve, one of the lines is, we believe neither student nor teacher excellence can be achieved or maintained in an atmosphere of fear and degradation. Okay? So the, the statement does mention uh, students and, and, and about how we're trying to develop citizens who can think critically and that these tests and these, these very short, shallow measurements do not allow us to develop as teachers and do not in any way allow students to develop, that they're very short-sighted. And in fact, if I were a conspiracist, um, I might say that that would be on purpose, that indeed politicians maybe have the long view of they don't want critically thinking uh, students becoming voting citizens. And that's why someone like Mayor Bloomberg can buy his third term. And that, and that actually goes along with um, the conversation that's been going around um, Seth Godin's book, um, you know, the, the, just the idea of, um, you know, what exactly is school about? You know, it's about creating work a workforce. It's about okay. creating cogs in a wheel. It's about you know, and, and it, that we need to completely rethink how we think of school. So, um, you know, I think it's important that you're putting that out there. And I and I, I wish that more than ten percent of people were responding. And and to me, going back to what I was saying before, I feel like there's this culture of fear, and that there's just you know more of us need to just let go of our fear because. You know, the more of us that come together, the less, the, the safer we are. Um, and, I, you know, that's kind of something I'm trying to, um, trying to explain to my colleagues is you, you can't be scared if 90% if of the staff all agree and speak their mind, you know, then, then there's something, you're safe. <laughs> you know, you, if you're going to be that one or two people, then, yeah, sure, you're going to be kind of, it's going to be a little scary. But once you get enough people on board, then you have that backing. And it doesn't matter whether you're unionized. It doesn't matter whether you have, like, technically support in some kind of contractual way. But, I mean, you see the Occupy Wall Street stuff and what happened there. You know, you can see the, the grassroots movement that happened there. And I just hope that teachers can step out of that culture of fear and really stick up for themselves at this point. I mean, that's what kind of what it's come down to, it seems like. Well, that's sort of what we felt. Sorry. Go ahead, Monica. Go ahead. Have any of you guys seen the Coney KONY 2012 video? Yeah. Um, that kind of
kind of echoes what MB just said about um, this is a multiplayer game. And so if we treat it that way and um, realize that it's not a scary place when we're, we all have, when everything is exposed. And I think that's what technology is allowing us for everything to be exposed, you know. So I think that's just an excellent model for us to, you know, follow after someone finding a specific piece, and maybe that's um, S Steve's narrative. Let's find some specific focus. What, I what is this all about? And let's decide to expose it and be bold enough to say um, the thing that we're afraid of, it's that tiny thing against all of us, you know. Well, I Can was I say just going to say that. that? Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Oh, I was just going to say that where's the research to support it? I mean, what, what I hear from the nearby professors that work with us from the College of New Jersey is that there is no research to show any correlation between a student performance and, 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 and the teacher uh, in that respect is the one thing. And in New Jersey, this is a big problem as well. It's just it's a very large problem here that we're having. And one of the big questions our teachers ask is, well, if you're going to measure this way anyway, what do you do when, when one teacher has all the AP students and another teacher has all the low achieving students? And I mean, I mean, there's just so many variables. I mean, that's all I had to say on that. Thank you. Well, then when you go to Bill, the introduce yourself, and they're and they're even so, saying that kids who come in who have taken the AP test and the AP classes on average are doing worse than the kids who haven't. So you know, we could go crazy on the statistics and the data, and so. As a group of educators, why are we not being, you know, more bold about the non-facts, you know? We're pretty bold about it here in New Jersey, but the governor's just horrible about it. He's just, he thinks, he thinks we're all bullies. So. It's funny you should mention bullies because um, this legislation that the BC teachers feel is bullying us um, was actually introduced on Anti-Bullying Day, and uh, there was a lot of irony in that. And uh, the, te the our premier standing there with a sea of pink behind her, introducing this legislation, which is essentially bullying the teachers to do what they, she wants. And that's one of the reasons why 40,000 teachers walked out is because we decided we try to teach our students to stand up to bullying, and so that's what we're going to do. We got together. A lot of teachers are not completely 100% behind walking out, but we all did it. And we did it because our premier is a bully. Her child goes to a private school. These are 40,000 public school teachers. And uh, we decided we're just not gonna take it anymore. And that might, that might be a big part of it, is that I'm sure all the governors and premiers and all these people who are involved in budget cuts and all this stuff, do their kids go to the pri private school or go to public school? Probably not, because they can afford to give their kids the education that, in reality, all kids should be getting. And I think um, I read an article recently about the Finnish school system, about, um, I believe it's Finnish. And uh, the one thing that really struck with me is that in Finland, or in this country, teachers are, teaching is an extremely respected career choice like you know oh you're a teacher that's like you know it it, it was re I wouldn't say revered but it was this respected thing and here like I've already said is that you got like teachers are seen as givens I think by the government or by other people or by the um you know and by you know it's y you're basically being um can't think of the word right now <laughs> Um, taken for granted, especially with increased standardization. They're all about, um, in New York, you know, it's all about how can we standardize how well teachers teach? How can we standardize tests so, so we know students are learning? How well, can, can we standardize? Uh, right. And it doesn't really do anything because teaching is on a case-by-case -case basis. So it's, I don't know, I, I think it's, it really, a lot of it is coming down to respect in the end. I, I can beat that. In New York, mm -hmm. they're trying to create entire classrooms 
that are where the kids sit in front of computers and all the teacher does is facilitate it. That's it. And then you can have remote learning and then you only need one teacher and like then you have a classroom of a thousand. That's mm -hmm. where they're headed. And by the way, our former chancellor of schools is now employed by the corporation that's trying to do that. Hmm. Curious. Conflict of interest. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Beth, that's the direction that our province is going right now too. Um, they're calling it uh, what self-directed learning, basically um, getting us and basically again no limits to the number of students that can be under the care of one teacher. And I just wanted to Steve mention with regards to report cards, we're not sending out formal report cards. Um, but as parents just have to send me an email or give me a phone call, and I tell them exactly how their student is doing. And a lot of parents actually preferred that. To the report cards that we actually do send out and would like and yeah so so what if what if teaching in classrooms aren't even part of the narrative i mean what if what if we need to you know get more focused on that narrative so that we don't spend all our time on the non-narrative and then you know do the plan of action and storm the whatever's and <laughs> what do you think chad Um, I don't know, coming back from DML, like uh, I put in the comments, I'm really not a, a fan of school for school's sake. And uh, I'm kind of fascinated by what goes on in maker spaces and would like schools to become more like those. But I also go back to walk out, walk on. And I, I think maybe the thing that shifted my thinking the most in the book was the notion of um, hospice and, and looking at the state of alternative education in, in Virginia, for example, and like, how difficult it is to pull off anything alternative here. Um, I can't, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe there needs to be team city as, you know, learning space and team hospice and they need to communicate and they need to find ways to kind of channel kids out of one to another with dignity. Hey, but I'm having a, like I'm struggling with the, the rhetoric against, um, like what, whatever schools will become if learning like that takes off, you know, if we're going to talk about learning in other places. MB, I just saw something that you had posted about doing all this through cities. Is that, did I just take it completely out of context or do you, re, do you recall that? It seems like it was today even or yesterday. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, yeah, you mean, I mean, I may have, I may have posted something in the chat in the future of education um, where I may have talked about, like, I think I put a post in there about school as community and community as school. I'm not sure if that's what it was, but just the idea of rethinking school, but I don't know if that's what you're talking about no, at all. Are, have you thought about that? Have you thought about rethinking through school through changing cities? Um, it's a like, and it's kind of what I've been I've been involved in the chat for a minute because um, coming from an urban environment, there's so many, so many, and I hate to say hurdles because I don't like to think of them as hurdles, but um, it's a very different situation. Um, you know, in in cities, you know, you talk about community schools. Well, what if your community is crime ridden? What if your community is not safe to be in? You know, so you have all those kind of things going on where. Um, e even the homeschooling argument, you know, and, and I know that I, Lisa Nielsen will probably argue me to death, but I think that, um, you know, Seth Godin makes a good point about you can't, um, you can't say, hey, kid, you, you were born into this horrible family unit, so now you're stuck with it, you know, and, and if we get rid of schools completely and homeschooling or, you know, per like parental community schooling is all we have, what do we do about these broken communities? Um, because they need support themselves in order to be able to educate students. So I don't even know if that goes along with what you're asking, but that's kind of where my thinking is on if we rethink schools as institutions, how do we rethink them in these kind of settings where, you know, people, because I, I definitely think as, as Chad was saying, the, the fab labs and the, the, the maker communities are so great and we have those in Philadelphia. Um, but then how do we reach those families that are struggling, those families that are broken, those, fa those families and those kids that are raising themselves? Um, you know, there's that whole aspect of it that needs to be addressed. 
I don't know if that answered your question, but. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I'm just curious what you're thinking. Thanks. So I, I want to I want to expand on or, or go back to Steve's notion of um, this is about students too, um, and I'll I'll get to that. But I, but I gotta say I've been thinking that teachers are disrespected, are feeling down, or you know have low job satisfaction. But you guys are saying that people are afraid and degraded that <laughs> those are really strong words and you know what they said happened in Egypt was that people lost their fear so here's my question <laughs> what would happen if teachers lost their fear but then further let's assume that students have fear as well what would happen if students lost their fear and I'm trying to get back to saying positively what, what we would have. Yes, we would not have fear, we would not have degradation, but then what would we have? Is that a fair question? <laughs> Somewhere in there. Nobody knows how to respond. Well, I mean, Jump you need, to, have whatever you were thinking. You yeah, need to be ready for a completely different kind of relationship between teachers and students. Um, not not only with the learning as Steve put into the into the chat there, but I mean, all over the place. I mean, the only students who were uh, fearless enough to deprogram me were like, <laughs> oh, our four, you know, no, F you kind of students. Uh, and they're, they're mm -hmm. essentially what, those students are the ones that flip my classroom. Not, not the successful school successful ones who are willing to comply with you know the ideas that I thought were clever. Um, and the students were like, no, until they were able to say exactly what they wanted to do and have the space to do that. And I think Chad, it goes also along with the idea of choice. Um, you know, we don't give kids a choice as much as we should. Where, and and then going back to the webinar earlier today. Um, and I forget who said it, but they're talking about, you know, a kid who is struggling in school and all they can think of was these parents need to take this kid out of school because school is not the place for them. They're not successful and it's not helping them and that they wish that they could express it to the parent and that the parent was, was educated enough to be able to make that, that choice. I'm not necessarily agreeing with everything of that sentiment, but I think that, <clears throat> and I've written a post or two about it, about the falsehood of school choice that we have right now, where the choice is charter, parochial, private, or public. And that's pretty much your choice. So, or, or homeschool. Um, you know, so um, that's not really much of a choice because most of them pretty much look the same. So I think that um, you know, the kids you were talking about, those FU kids, um, they need some other option. And there's no, right now, there's no real safety net for them. Um, no place for them to go, um, you know, unless they're able to seek out and find um, a home, I should say, where they feel comfortable. Right. Or they're able to find like an online school or some kind of option like that. But I just, yeah, I think choice right now is a really big problem that we have. Yeah, and if, if one way school systems could kind of remain relevant and get back into that race with these other spaces would be to diversify what they do and to radically reconceptualize um, transportation and, and like you said choice it shouldn't be a choice amongst you know scores as to where you go um, I had something about it, so I'll come back to it can I say something on that MB yeah go ahead, um, go ahead. as a student I really like um, how you keep talking about choice and uh, I, I know in um, my school, the uh, resources were so few that a student couldn't even choose to take a, um, if they didn't want to take the uh, typical math class, they couldn't, there weren't the resources, the, the teachers, the services to even offer an application to math. Or if they didn't want to take English 12, they didn't even have the opportunity to take a um, communications course. I actually was in English 12. There was a student um, who had uh, learning disabilities, actually, who basically 
it's a grade our school's version of a communication course was English 12, except you didn't have to do some of the assignments. Um, but I also have a friend who really wasn't school smart. She could quote, she could quote Shakespeare and she could do, she was a very intelligent person, but the way that we were educated, the way that you're sp were supposed to be educated, simply didn't work for her and as such she didn't excel in school and, and maybe perhaps in other states she could have. So I do think that offering increased choices to students and different ways of educating is an important um, thing to make to, to strive for. Just my thought as a student myself. And um, go ahead. Can I come back to something? Uh, I, was, I was just going to say, go one ahead. of the things, and I put it all over in, in, the, in the chat, um, when Steve was talking about a narrative earlier, you know, one of the narratives that would be good to, to develop is the narrative as teacher as witness to what the systems are doing uh, to kids. Because I think what's of interest is, you know, what's happening to kids, not so much what's happening to teachers. And so there's a lot of ambiguity for me in how we frame our, our labor disputes right now. But I, I would kind of put something out there. You know, Godin talks about unconditional love at the Harlem School. I might talk about unconditional learning. But there are times in, in our dialogues internally as teachers when I think things like respect come in as a condition. And you can't have an a system that supports unconditional learning where you know respect is a prerequisite for some kind of access to the best of what a teacher has to offer, or even to get into the classroom sometime. And that's another thing that you know my students have taught me and how they flipped our room. And I'm not always great at this, but the more unconditional you can be as an educator, the more room there is, not just for that choice, but the belief that you'll preserve that choice and create a space where a student can engage with that choice and you know get the cover that maybe you wish you had from, from testing, things like that. Does somebody does somebody want to try to address Chad's question there? If I could ex make it a little bigger. Those of us who want to change education, change the way it is for kids, um, aren't necessarily involved in labor disputes. <laughs> is is there a deeper connection between the question of respect for teachers and this? and the question of respect for students. I feel there is, but I just wanted to see if somebody might be able to make the case for that. I'm gonna jump in. Um, yeah. I teach in a school that's very test prep driven, that is very prescriptive, and my teachers um, don't help write the curriculum. We follow the school district, cur school district curriculum. And I think that there's a point where teachers, when their creativity and their, um, you know, we, you know, I have a master's degree. Some people I work with have master's degrees. You know, you've you've gone through, mm -hmm. through all these this training, you know, you've been in the classroom, you have experience, but that experience and that training is not valued. That I think that ties back to, um, you as a teacher, you teach differently. When I teach stuff that I created and I teach stuff that I help mm -hmm. think through and develop, I teach it differently than I do when I'm told to teach something a certain way. Um, and in the end, it comes down to my students. You know, my students, I think my students are going to get a better experience from um, something that I have really delved into and created than something that I'm just mm -hmm. rant, 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 that I'm just doing because I'm told to do it. Um, so I think that there is a connection between the kind of education our students get and the kind of um, treatment and the professionalism involved in the career that teachers have chosen. Um, I, I, I think that it's getting worse <laughs> as the tests get more important and as um, you know, race to the top and, and value added this and all that kind of stuff, it's just going to get worse where teachers are going to be afraid to take risks. Um, that fear thing again, um, to try new things and to experiment and to um, and to to really reach their students in a different way. 
because it's not valued by the, the system or valued by those who evaluate them. So that's my two cents. So if the other Mary Beth can throw something into. Um, Go ahead, Mary Beth. I can remember back, um, let me think how old I am now. More than 20 years ago when uh, my husband and I got divorced, I knew deep poverty after my divorce and I was on welfare. And I can remember that a lot of people were willing to help my infant daughter, but less willing to help her adult mother. And I thought to myself, we too are tied together. And in very much the same way, the success of a teacher is the success of the child. Now that's not complete because there are times where children need to be removed from their homes, but that would be the exception and the extreme. And so that I think when you think of a classroom and, and a school, you have to look at raising the boat in the water and not saving a single passenger. And, and I remember that as being something substantial that I learned in my poverty that I felt was a very valuable wealth that I walked away from it with it. And, and I think that translates to the school community. Very nicely said. Other thoughts? <laughs> that was very, very nicely said. I, uh, I, I really like that analogy. Thank you. How do you guys in BC argue or make the point that it's not just about your salaries that you're going on strike for? Well, the media has made a real point of trying to make it look like it is just the salaries that we're going on strike for. Mm -hmm. But we actually try to really focus on the fact that uh, in 2005, we had the right to negotiate class size and composition removed from our contracts. And this is something that we want back. We want the right to negotiate class size and composition because we feel that that is what is best truly for the students. So although the media keeps saying we're all about money, we're all about money, you say to some of the teachers, yeah, it's about the money. Put 40, put 40 kids in my classroom if you want. Just pay me enough to be there. But for a lot of other teachers, it has nothing to do with the, with the money. It's just about wanting basically what we see as fair, the proper resources for teaching the students that are in our class, making sure that we have the education assistance in the classroom that we need to help with the students with identified issues. And um, yeah, for, for me personally, it has very little to do with the money. For me personally, it is about, you know, I, I'm hoping that by this time next year, I'm going to be a full-time home economics teacher. And anybody, and I always like to say, you know, give me 20 grade 12s with knives and I'm happy, but give me 30 grade 12s with knives in one classroom that's actually built for 24, that's a different story. And then when you put an entire table of students in there, one EA, and they've all got learning and behavior issues, I'm not teaching anymore. I'm simply a warm body in a classroom watching, you know, making sure nobody gets hurt. And that's not what I want to be. So. It isn't about the money. It is about the students as far as most of us are concerned. So. Did I answer OK? So <laughs> we're hoping to actually get I, I just the very least the cost of living. But. Right. It's about the money, too. I mean, it's about fair. It is. I mean, Steve, if we could come back to the narrative, the, the word fair was just used. That's maybe getting somewhere. <laughs> it's similar to equality that you mentioned at the beginning. Yeah, but you know, we're trying to fair fight for fairness. Hmm. But Steve, you've, do you have any thoughts here as we kind of get into an end point here? Well, I guess that what occurred to me is that the, the narrative I'm thinking of, that's dignity and respect for all, that you know that uh, nobody should be seen as defective, is a is a pretty radical shift. It's a radical shift in how we think about learning, and I guess what I'm taking away from this conversation, and maybe not fairly, but at least it's my takeaway, is that we may have to convince mm -hmm. teachers of this as much as anybody else. Meaning, um, I think it's very easy for the teachers to see the unfairness of the situation in New York, 
but my guess is that it's pretty hard to extend that to actually thinking about the unfairness to students. I have smart children, you know, they do well, um, but the truth is, uh, you know, a lot of their schooling is about ranking and grades, and my 13-year-old right now stresses over every grade, and she got a 79 on her science fair project. And the teacher filled out the six-page form of all the things that were wrong with the science fair project, but she had never given that form in advance of the project. And I said, can you go talk to her? And she said, no, well, she won't talk to me. She said, that's just the grade. And I thought, okay, so that's not actually learning. I don't, you know, I know the pressures that teacher is under, and I feel, you know, I'm, I'm not passing any judgment. But I think there is a parallel story here, and it may actually be hard for teachers to see this parallel. But but my personal sense is that that, that, that they're pretty much the same story, that, that there's, a, there's a sense of ranking deficiency, better or worse, that doesn't serve the learning well, but serves a culture of, kind of compliant workers in an obedience culture. And, and that sounds dramatic and it sounds Seth Godin-like, but I think it's the truth of, sort of when I grew up, that was the expectation of the kind of work world I'd go into. And if in fact, we have to be preparing students for a long tail world, a world in which it's very horizontal and a lot of careers that, that depend on being self-starters and initiative takers, we're gonna have to think of a way to respect teachers and students uh, in, in a way that we currently don't. So I hope that's a reasonable takeaway, but that's my takeaway. It's a very helpful one. My hope is that this is a moment that when we feel it as teachers, <laughs> we can see the other happening as well. It might be a moment to push for it. Yeah. Seriously, in my classes that I'm teaching in right now, Every single day, I say to them, what I'm trying to get through to you guys is respect. Respect for yourselves, respect for your environment, and respect for your, the people around you. I'm te currently teaching Planning 10, and you know, and that, for me, is what I'm trying to get across to them. And I try to practice it as much as I preach it with my students. And many students in BC actually did recognize or acknowledge the, um, or at least students in Vancouver. On uh, last Friday, there was a general walkout. I think a bunch of students in several schools in the Lower Mainland near Vancouver. Across the, across across the, the province. Benches? Oh, okay. Walked out at 2, 1.30 yep. or 2 o'clock in the afternoon to protest what's currently being done to um, protest the teachers. And what I think is remarkable about that is that this legislation that's being tried to pass would effectively say teachers can't strike. So it's all about this, you know, teachers are, in BC at least, teachers are having to rely on other unions or could have to rely on other unions to protect their own interests because they themselves aren't allowed to strike, wouldn't be allowed to strike should this legislation pass. Thank you. Um, we, we do wanna, begin to draw this down. Bill, did you have any final thoughts there in New Jersey? <laughs> Hello, Neil. Are you there still? Well, there you are. I don't know about the student and teacher thing together. Oh, am I here? Can you hear me? Can you yep, hear me? We can. Can you hear me? Oh, because I can't hear it myself. Yes. Okay. okay. I mean, the, the, between the students, the students and the teachers, I'm not so sure what I'd say, but, but I think there's a bigger, bigger problem here that has to do with more of a social. Uh, oh, I'm trying not to say the word, but it's. It, it, I, I think there's. <laughs> uh, there's a problem with what's being done with all the unions and 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 what's happening to the middle class, and their mm -hmm. failure to realize their own consciousness, and I think that's the big problem that's behind all this. I don't know what else to say. If I say anything else, I'll probably get fired. So. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> I think it's the you used to come on all the time before we were video. So, you look good, Bill. Thanks well, for thank coming. <laughs> Mary Beth White Whitehouse, we'll let you have final thought here, and then oh, we should. Oh, big responsibility. Okay. Um, nah. Whatever you well, think. I don't know if people have seen my uh, 
statement. And if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to read that as the last thing I say. I, I spent a lot of time writing it. Do it. Uh, that sounds good. Mm. Okay. We the undersigned were ranked in the 99th percentile on the recently released teacher data reports in New York City. We believe these data are outdated, invalid, and inaccurate with unacceptable margins of error. We believe reliable evidence of authentic teaching and learning cannot be derived from standardized test results. We believe the publishing of these data will, in the long run, result in less classroom creativity and more shallow, test-focused instruction incapable of developing citizens who can think critically. We believe the publishing of these data has proven demoralizing and humiliating and that media stories which portray some teachers as the best and others as the worst are incendiary, invidious, and irresponsible. We believe neither student nor teacher excellence can be achieved or maintained in an atmosphere of fear and degradation. We believe teaching is a complex profession, at least as much art as science, requiring intricate, multifaceted assessments for development. Um, and we'll have a link to that um, in the chat and everything um, that we'll put up. Thank you, everybody. Um, when I, as we're ending here, say that we've been broadcasting over the EdTech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network. And we want to thank Dave Lebo and Dave Lebo. That was good. I've done that before. Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier. Um, for helping pull all this together. Thank all of you. I loved hearing from the different perspectives. And I hope we all lose our fear. <laughs> Good night. Good night, Paul. Good night, guys. Thank you so much for including me. It was awesome. Bye, Mary Beth. Great. No, bye, Mary Beth. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm jealous of your kitty. <laughs> this is Oliver. <laughs> She's very cute. Yeah. <laughs> Here's another one. <laughs> oh, All right. Good night, guys. Good, good night. night. Good night.